And now we will start with our first speaker, Dominic, Dominic who is doing his PhD at Simon Rumpel at jo Jonas Gohetenberg University in Mainz. He is in his last part of his PhD, which he explored the long-term long dynamics of sensory representations in the mouse auditor cortex, which he is going to also to talk, uh, talk about today. The link for his uh, published work will be posted in the chat shortly. His talk is titled Chronic Imaging of Local Populations in Auditor Cortex Reveals Ongoing Recombinations of Neural Assembles Representing Sensory Stimuli. Dominic, stage is yours. Thank you very much, Hürige. Hürige. I'm sharing my screen now. Yeah. Hope everybody can see it. Yep, we can see your lovely so, light. Great. So the main question I would like to address here is trying to bridge the observations that uh, synaptic connections between neuronal networks of cortical neurons are highly dynamic, even under baseline conditions when there is no behavioral training. While behavioral output can be highly stable over time, as an example here, um, where we show freezing levels um, to an auditory stimulus after field conditioning, which can be maintained for very long time scales. It's clear that neuronal activity patterns in these dynamic networks are responsible for driving these behaviors, but little is known about their long-term functional properties. So here I briefly mentioned the methods I employ to study these questions. We use two photon calcium imaging of local um, populations in auditory cortex and record their responses to a broad set of sound stimuli, including pure tones and complex broadband temporally modulated sounds. During our recordings, the animal is head fixed and awake while passively listening to sounds. And finally, due to virally driven gene expression of two fluorophores, a structural marker and a calcium indicator, I record the activity of the same neurons over at least a week. On a single time point, we observe that neural um, populations elicit a discrete set of activity patterns in response to sounds, where multiple stimuli are being grouped together um, and drive a highly similar, res similar response pattern, which we term response mode. As in this example, this behavior can be even seen in response to gradually changing stimuli, such as neighboring pure tone frequencies where there's an abrupt transition from one response mode to the other. And if there is no response elicited, this we would then term uh, now mode. Over long time scales, we observe that most stimuli are actually being represented in a very stable manner and drive the same response mode on all time points. Here you can see the mean response spin after the presentation of a given stimulus of an example field of view color coded for delta F over F zero and I hope you can appreciate that indeed, these are the same neurons and the same activity pattern on all time points. On the other hand, we also observe um, features with strong temporal dynamics. For example, a stimulus which was driven by a given response pattern is not encoded anymore on the last imaging day in this case and falls into the null mode. And it was extremely surprising for us to see that we can also observe complete switches in the response pattern. In this example, you can see a stimulus which was stably encoded by a given um, pattern on three um, time points. And there is a switch on the last time point where now a completely different response mode is mapping this particular stimulus. So in order to study these dynamics in a more systematic way, we came up with a framework of 10 elementary operations capturing all these possible dynamics. Due to the limited time, I will not go through the whole decision tree here, um, but simply mention our basic um, strategy. So we observe whether a given stimulus X is being represented by a, uh, a given population on, on time point day I, and then what will happen to this stimulus on time point I plus two. So if there was a response, it can either be driven by the same response again, or it can fall into the null mode. Or for example, it could be driven now by a different response mode. And whether this different response mode now was already existing, pre-existing in the population, or it was newly created, um, and some other different conditions, we end up with this complete set of 10 elementary operations. 
And it's important to note that we can actually observe all of these 10 different ob observations in our data sets to a variable degree. Now, finally, in order to test whether these operations are actually able to help us understand how the brain works, we made similar experiments with another cohort of animals, which underwent an auditory acute field conditioning paradigm in the middle of the recording experiment. We observed that after field conditioning, um, neuronal populations um, showed a higher degree of encoding of sound stimuli. And this could be due to two different um, reasons. On the one hand, um, this increased encoding could be due to an increased mapping of stimuli onto given modes or to an increase in the number of modes. Um, and important to note, both of these outcomes are not mutually exclusive. And by using our framework of the elementary operation, we observed that between the two groups, we did not see a difference in operations increasing the number of modes, but specifically those operations were increased, which um, increased the stimuli onto a given mode. So to come to my conclusion slide, um, I've acquired a data set of 20 mice, more than 21,000 neurons on more than four time points. We have shown that local neuronal ensembles categorize sounds into a few different response modes. Uh, Long-term dynamics reveal an ongoing recombination of neuronal ensembles and our novel framework of tell elementary observations captures learning-induced plasticity. So with this, I would like to thank my supervisor, Simon, and my collaborators, Bastian and Matthias, and special thanks to Bastian, who I would like to mention is um, equal contribution in all of this work. So thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Dominic. This is a nice, uh, I mean, very short and brief results. We have one question from our audience. Le Lina Ali Ibrahim is asking, does the no response mode have any correlation with how many times you have presented the stimulus or the opposite effect where the repeated presentation enhanced enhanced response? So um, perhaps I can go back to this slide here. Um, so we actually present each stimulus in the equal number of trials. So these are 20 to 30 trials on a given time point. And um, actually in a given rural population, um, only a very small set of sound stimuli is able to drive this, um, these neurons. So the majority of stimuli are actually not encoded by a given um, local population. And I should mention that um, on a given field of view, we are able to record two to 300 neurons at the same time. If you repeat the same tri tri uh, same stimuli again and again, you know, the, uh, do you see any salience effect or any changes in the neural activities? Because you are repeating the same stimuli. Yes. So um, this is completely true. I'm repeating the same stimuli um, in a passive setting. So mm -hmm. there's no um, valency. Um, to these stimuli. Um, what I didn't mention is that I, um, I, I habituate the animals already one week before actually starting the recording to um, this um, experimental setting. Um, but um, so it has been published that habit, um, habituation to passive listening leads to a decrease of sounds. And I also see this in a small degree, but I think most of these dynamics are already being um, stopped by this habituation session, which I'm doing. Okay, they are getting familiar to the stimuli before. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. And cook. For maybe you can go and ex tell us more about these ten steps formation, which you briefly mentioned, because I think this is quite interesting. Sure. Right? Um. So. I can show you uh, some more data. Um, so here you can see a, a TSNE representation of all of these um, operations. Maybe first of all, I would like to um, point your attention to the plot on the bottom right. So this is actually the distribution of each of these operations in um, all fields of view. So these are 97 fields of view. 
And as you can see, um, I mentioned briefly during the talk, there's a variable degree um, of occurrence of each of these operations. And um, perhaps this is alluding to the first question, the constancy zero would be a, um, a no response to uh, still no response. So this is the, the most of the stimuli. Um, and then followed by the stable um, mapping of um, a given sound onto a response mode. So if we look at the TSNI representations, um, each of the dot represents a given trial. And I color code an example stimulus, which um, shows um, an example for this particular observation. So from constancy zero, we would have all of the trials randomly distributed in the null mode. A creation, you don't see this given mode on time point day i, but on time point day i plus two, this new response mode is being created and those stimuli are being mapped here. Um, yeah, I can continue to go through all of them. Um, so these are examples from the data in a TSNI um, representation for each of those represent each of those operations. That looks interesting. We have one more question for you. Lena is asking, have you distinguished between excitatory and inhibitory neurons in terms of the overall effect you presented? Yeah, so thank you for this question. Um, actually, in my experiments, I'm using a synapsin promoter to drive the expression of um, the calcium indicator. So the simple answer is no, I do not um, distinguish between excitatory and inhibitory neurons. Um, and I see a all neurons at the same time, and I don't make any difference. But definitely, to, it would be interesting to look at that, and people in the lab are doing that actually. Yeah, it is the same with the layers. Maybe if you can see more in the deeper layers compared to superficial layers. Yeah. So the deepest I go is about three hundred micrometers. So it's not really going beyond layer two, three. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. And. Thank you very much for your talk and we and these are all interesting and it is a hard data to collect i know that it's just like in the two photon when you're recording from the same cell across many days finding the same field this is a beautiful data set and now, now we are going to move to our next